get into this fantastic conversation. Um, a few events that we have coming up that I wanted to let you all know about. Um, for a variety of reasons, particularly in the next coming months, we all might be feeling a little bit of stress. And so I wanted everyone to know, December 1st, our monthly Getting Dirty program is a workshop called Herbs for Stress Relief. So we'll be learning about um, the practical indications that different herbs have for being able to use in our lives. And then we'll be actually making two oils um, to then take home with us. Um, we'll be getting the instructions and everything. So if you want, you can also make them again at home. But if the holidays are stressful or politics are stressful, um, something that you can do to actually do some self-care and take care of yourself in the meantime. So there are flyers for these on the back table. Um, because it is a workshop, it is a required registration. So if you're interested, make sure you sign up. And then as well, um, for the past few years, we have had a wonderful partnership with Drama Dogs. They're one of our local theater companies. Um, and every two years in December, they partake in what's called climate change theater action. And so Sunday, December 8th at 3 p.m., um, we will be partnering with Drama Dogs and they will be performing six of the climate change action plays. Um, and that will be here in Faulkner and just as with all of our other drama dog presentations, there will be a talk back afterwards to actually engage in conversation, not only about the piece, but also what else is going on around climate change in our community and worldwide. So these are two events that I encourage you to look at the next upcoming Sunday, so De Sunday, December 1st, and Sunday, December 8th. The flyers are on the back table, so pick those up if you are interested. Um, today, though, we have a amazing panel of women in leadership, women in politics, women in action, and for that, I will bring up the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara President, Vijaya Jamalamadaka. Thank you, Jen, uh, and the Santa Barbara Public Library for co-sponsoring with us. Uh, this forum is co-sponsored by them. Um, good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to our distinguished panel and to all of you. Um, our forum today is called Countdown to 100, Women Leaders Talk Across Generations. So we've got all generations here, as we think. Um, I am Vijaya Jamalamarka, the president of our local league. Our membership table is near the entrance. Please support us, join us as a member. I have a number of announcements for the league, so please bear with me. Um, I wanted to first tell you uh, if you're a member, and if you're not, we, <laughs> we are looking for a treasurer and an event planner. So in case you are interested. Um, I also wanted to let you know that we are part of Santa Barbara Gives. This should be in the Independent this week. And uh, you can read all about us along with the other nonprofits um, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, pamphlet. And um, we also have two discussion groups to continue the conversation of this topic of the forum. Uh, on November 22nd, uh, we'll be meeting at Dargan's for a lunch. It's a no-host lunch. And then uh, on December 3rd, we'll be meeting in the evening. It's a supper group uh, at Madame Lou's. So RSVPs are required. Today, after the forum, I want to tell you that we will have a short reception in one of the rooms in the back over there, and all of you are invited to join us. Um, and, and you can speak with our panelists one-on-one uh, -on -one at that time. Now, this is the last forum of the year, and our next forum will be on January 15th from noon to two. Um, the League will be collaborating with the Center for Global Dialogue on the topic of prison reform. Specifically, we will be exploring contending approaches to lowering the rate of recidivism by comparing the American approach 
with what happens in most of Europe. And Peter Hasland will be our moderator, and he will moderate a panel of experts on this issue. So please read our email updates and check our website calendar for all our upcoming events. We have many of them, which I'm not announcing here. Um, thank you to Gary Atkins, Sound Systems, and Sylvia Uribe of uh, Pranzil Pro for simultaneous Spanish translation. If you would like to hear the presenters in Spanish, please ask her for headphones. Thank you to our TVSB crew, JP Montalvo, who is in charge of this production and will live stream this event via Facebook right now as we speak. It's going on. Um, both English and Spanish versions of the video will be available on the League's YouTube site. Uh, we have a link on our website. So check that out, and also check TVSB's website for their schedule to see when this video will be aired on Channel 17 and 71. A big thank you to Vicki Allen and the League team for organizing this forum, and for Suzanne Brathen, who is back in town just in time for uh, the, doing the hospitality for this forum. Now, um, Beth Pitten August will be our moderator, I'd like to introduce Beth. Beth joined the League of Women Voters in, uh, of Santa Barbara in 2005. She has served um, our League in many capacities and briefly served on the League's State Board. With 20 years of experience as a nonprofit professional, she currently works as the Director of Development at UCSB's Bren School of Environmental Science Management. An important project that Beth is undertaking in her free time is a documentary film. It's called Just the Beginning, A Century of Women's Political Power. This was born out of her passion for women's rights and storytelling and her admiration for her fellow League members who have dedicated themselves to making democracy work for everyone. Please welcome our moderator, Beth Pitten August. Now it's official. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Countdown to 100, a conversation across generations. It's a true privilege to be here with these uh, women holding office and having served in public office. I want to also recognize that we have many other women. We just could not fill the whole room and the whole table with all of the women in our community and elsewhere that have served in public office or are currently serving. If I invite you, if you have served or are currently serving public office, please stand up. We want to recognize you too. Thank you. So 2020 approaches rapidly, and it's a very critical year for our democracy. It's uh, important elections coming up. And we had a historic um, election just last year, 2018, when a record a number of women ran and won public office. Now, uh, it's almost a year to go before we celebrate that centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And we invite women uh, currently in our community who have um, dedicated themselves to public service. And to honor a uh, woman I've had the privilege of meeting through the project that Vijaya um, <laughs> described, Joy Pikus. And we brought her up here because she's such an important part of the discovery of the history of women's <laughs> political power that I've discovered through, through my um, project but also just finding that she's got all these wonderful connections to women here in Santa Barbara who also have served, and um, we all want to honor her here today. So I will briefly rec uh, introduce our panelists, but one of the things I also wanted to mention is that um, winning the right to vote was a process for women. Not every uh, woman actually gained the right to vote and access to the vote, with that 19th Amendment. 
I'm going to read uh, some notes that uh, describe the history and the process, starting even here with California. The suffrage movement did not include all women, excluding women and men of color. Today, the League fights for the opportunity for everyone to make their voices heard and their votes count. Women have come a long way since Joy Pikus ran for office. The panelists will talk about where we have been and where we are going. 2011 marked the 100th anniversary of the historic election in California that finally secured the right of California women to vote and run for public office. It is unfathomable today uh, that we think upon a time when women did not have access to the vote and therefore a decisive input into the future of our communities, our state, and our nation. Even though our state was ahead of its time, and thankfully we currently remain so in many ways, it's important to note that Prop 4 passed only after women suffragists and their allies worked hard to convince the public of the righteousness of their cause. The voters passed Prop 4 with just 50.7% of the vote, a divided nation back then as well. Voters defeated a similar measure in 1986 in California. In 1980, or 1886, I'm sorry, 1896, I'm transposing numbers. The measure lost uh, primarily because of San Francisco a city that is today known, of course, for progressive causes and, and uh, leading our state. But it was rural counties like San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara who voted for women's suffrage. And our margins uh, increased, and we, in 1911, uh, came around. San Francisco voted against women's uh, suffrage again but San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties passed with the strong enough margins that helped overcome that urban rural gap. So the rural and the urban, uh, pro-women, pro uh, and sometimes we do feel like we're, we're living in uh, a repeating process. So now I'd like to introduce each of our uh, guests here today. Joy Pikus is former Los Angeles City Council member who represented uh, West San Fernando Valley from 1977 to 1993. She had a strong reputation as an effective and responsive elected official who got the job done. Her major public policy achievements were in garbage and hazardous waste and dependent care and the creation of a family-friendly city. She's nationally recognized for her promotion of opportunities for women. Pike has continued her civic leadership as a board member of several nonprofit organizations. She has served as president and chair of the Board of Friends of the Griffith Observatory. She recently retired from the board of Jewish World Watch, Community Partners, and the foundation board of California State University Northridge. She serves on the dean's councils for their colleges of arts and media communication, and the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, as well as being an active member and ambassador for the Soroya, formerly the Valley Performing Arts Center. She's a proud alumna of the University of Wisconsin and an emeritus member of the Board of Visitors for the College of Letters and Sciences, as well as past chair and current member of the UW Foundation Women's Philanthropy Council. She's especially proud to have received the distinguished alumna uh, award from the University of Wisconsin in 2002. Other significant honors include the Woman of the Year in 1985 in recognition of her outstanding leadership in the pay equity comparable worth for the city of Los Angeles. This was Ms. Magazine Woman of the Year in 1985, excuse my. Joy has been married to Dr. Gerald Pikus for over 67 years. That is, that's an accomplishment right there. <laughs> they have three married children, six grandchildren, nine counting spouses, and two great-grandchildren. She considers herself the proud matriarch of a loving and accomplished family. Thank you, Joy.
Next, Susan Rose. During her more than 30 years experience in public administration, education, and community activism, Susan Rose has been committed to the advancement of women, workplace issues, and civil rights. She served two four-year terms on the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors, during which she led efforts to create initiatives for affordable housing and homelessness, to improve the quality of life for women and families, and to ensure the environmental health of her community, our community. Prior to that, Susan was executive director of the Los Angeles City Commission, on the, excuse me, the City Commission on the Status of Women. She also held positions in local government and directed a nonprofit agency. Susan believes that women can make a difference in the lives of women and children through changes in public policy. She's worked for the realization of gender equality on all levels of government by organizing women to become advocates and to assume political leadership. In 1988, Susan was a founding member of the Santa Barbara Women's Political Committee and currently serves on the board of Emerge California, a political leadership training program. These organizations are dedicated to helping women gain appointed and elected office. Currently, Susan Rose is a member of the Santa Barbara Human Rights Watch, where she's focused her efforts on eliminating the national backlog of rape kits. She served on the advisory committees of the Women's Rights Division of HRW and the Women's Campaign International, which is an international leadership development program. She's also served on the board of the local Planned Parenthood Action Fund, is a member of the Santa Barbara Advisory Board of the Anti-Defamation League, and a director of the McCune Foundation, whose focus is social justice. While a member of the Board of Trustees of Antioch University Santa Barbara, she initiated a leadership program for mid-career women. Thank you, Susan. Good morning. And now, Janet Wolf, a Southern California native, Janet earned a BA degree from UC Santa Barbara and a master's degree in teaching credential from UCLA. Right after Janet and her husband Harvey married in 1977, they moved to San Francisco, where Janet taught at a junior high school. After their first daughter was born, she and Harvey moved back to Santa Barbara, and in 1983, she began working as a vocational rehabilitation consultant. Soon after, Janet opened her own successful and highly respected rehabilitation consulting business with offices in Santa Barbara and Santa Maria. Her career in public service began in 1993, when she was elected to the Goleta School Board, where she served for 12 years. During her time on the board, running her business and raising three daughters with Harvey, Janet also served on the boards of the pre and presided as president on the Santa Barbara County School Board Association, the Santa Barbara Chapter of National Charity League, and the Planned Parenthood Action Fund Board. In 2006, Janet was elected to the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors and was re-elected in 2010 and 2014. She retired from the Board of Supervisors in January this year, 2019. While on the Board of Supervisors, Jan Janet was a leader on issues of concern to women and children's health, public safety, environmental stewardship, community planning, excellent constituent service, and transparent public policy. Through her service on the Commission on Children in Foster Care, the Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council, SenCal Health, and Santa Barbara County Retirement Board, Janet was a strong advocate of the county's most vulnerable populations, or as a term she coined, our human infrastructure. Janet received recognition for her 24 years of elected community service, including the Carpinteria Women of the Year from Girls Inc., the Domestic Values Award of the Democratic Central Committee, and the Roses Award from the Santa Barbara Women's Political Committee, the Giraffe Award for, from Planned Parenthood Action Fund, the 2018 Woman of the Year Award from Democratic Women of Santa Barbara County, and the 2019 Woman of the Year Award from State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson and State Assembly Member Monique Lamone. Janet's biggest award, however, is Harvey. Married for 42 years, her three daughters, sons-in-law, and her precious four grandchildren, Micah, Avi, Sophie, and Talia. As a happy retiree, Janet can be seen playing pickleball, taking number seven MTD bus downtown, walking and listening to podcasts, that's me too, cooking, 
meeting up with longtime friends, traveling and visiting with her grandchildren, continued involvement in all things political, and enjoyed enjoyment that Santa Barbara has to offer. Janet is tremendously grateful for the engagement of the Santa Barbara community on all of those that she's had and met throughout her incredible journey. And we're pleased to have you with us, Janet. Luce Reyes Martin, welcome. Luce identifies as many things immigrant, mother, feminist, advocate. Statistically, Luce shouldn't be where she is today. Her family immigrated to Los Angeles area when she was a child. Her family received government nutritional aid at home and in school, and she was an English learner. The product of public K through 12 schools, she ultimately graduated with a bachelor's degree from Stanford University. She went on to obtain Master's of Land Use Planning and Master of Public Administration degrees from the University of Southern California. Luce has worked professionally in the fields of economic development, land use planning, public affairs, and communications. She currently works as the Executive Director of Public Affairs and Communications for Santa Barbara City College. In spring 2014, at the age of 28, she was appointed to fill a vacancy on the Goleta Union School Board District, District School Board. She successfully ran for the seat in November 2014 and was re-elected in 2018. She was the youngest and first Latina elected to the Goleta School Board. Luce is proud to serve her community in other capacities, such as president of the Santa Barbara Women's Political, Commi Political Committee, the executive committee of the Santa Barbara Sierra Club, and the board of the Planned Parenthood Central Coast Action Fund. Luce is passionate about advocating for and working with communities to achieve racial, economic, and environmental justice. Thank you. Excuse me, Kristen. Kristen Sneddon was elected in 2017 to serve a four-year term on the Santa Barbara City Council. She currently serves as the chair of the Ordinance Committee, Sea Level Rise Adaptation Plan Subcommittee, and the De La Guerra Plaza Revitalization Concept Plan Subcommittee. In addition, she serves on the committees of Community Choice Energy, Sustainability, as well as liaison to the Creeks Advisory Committee, Parks and Recreation Commission, Santa Barbara Youth Council, and the Water Commission Board. Kristen represents the city to regional agencies of the Kachuma Conservation Release Board, as well as the Kachuma Operations and Maintenance Board. Prior to serving on council, she was chair of the Peabody Charter School Governing Board and chair of the Star King Parent-Child Workshop Board. She also currently teaches in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department at Santa Barbara City College. Kristen lives in Santa Barbara with her husband and three children. Thank you so much, Kristen. <laughs> Last but not least, Gloria Soto was born and raised and educated in Santa Maria. She's the daughter of immigrant farm working parents who made numerous sacrifices to ensure she would have a better life and who also taught her the value of hard work and determination. Gloria took advantage of opportunities afforded to her by her family and community. She's a proud past participant of Future Farmers of America and Future Leaders of America. Gloria has dedicated her young professional career to advancing reproductive health care access on the Central Coast. Since 2011, Gloria has served in a variety of positions at Planned Parenthood California Central Coast including in education, public affairs, and development. She's currently the major gifts officer working to expand care by stewarding donors to Planned Parenthood, California Central Coast, their vision of health care access. Her commitment to her community has also led her to serve on the boards of community-based organizations. Gloria served four years as a board member for the Future Leaders of America, one of the largest Latinx youth serving organizations in the state of California, and also sits on the board for the Fund for Santa Barbara. Gloria was elected in 20, 2018 as part of that national wave of young women of color seeking to bring representation to local governments. 
She is the first council member to be elected under Santa Maria's new district election and at the age of 29 made history by being the youngest woman elected. Gloria is, the on is only the sixth woman to be elected to the Santa Maria City Council. Today, she and her family reside in Santa Maria. Gloria is bilingual, bicultural, and deeply connected to the many communities in the Santa Maria Valley. Gloria enjoyed spending time with family, reading, watching horror films, and ca a casual bananagram game. Gloria attended Pioneer Valley High School and earned her associate's degree at Allen Hancock College and her BA at Chapman University. Welcome, Gloria. And please help me, please help me welcome uh, these women of substance here. We have a lot of ground we want to cover, and I wanted to be sure to give them all justice by covering, um, and this isn't really all uh, they each accomplished. These are the highlights. So um, welcome you all once again. Um, what we're going to do is have somewhat of an informal conversation. We're inviting uh, these folks to describe why they ran for office, what they aim to achieve in office, what barriers they faced, what advice they might share to others. And I'm, uh, as long as we don't get too uh, crazy, I'm inviting them to, to dialogue to respond to one another's stories, because it's really through that, hearing one another's stories and having an opportunity to exchange stories that I think we really um, come to common ground and uh, can achieve more together. So I'm gonna invite Joy first to start. Um, it's, of, it's, those, of those framed questions, why you ran for office, what you aim to achieve, perhaps you could start there. It's, it's always a treat to come to Santa Barbara, and I thank you all for inviting me, and to Lori Wheeler and Margaret Pontius, who provided transportation here, and it's, just, and it's been very exciting, as so many of you have come up and told me of how you belonged in my previous life or my current life. I have to give a special shout out to Barbara Marjoram, who was perhaps the first League of Women Voters member I met when I moved to the San Fernando Valley in 1962. And Barbara and I, she, she left very shortly after she helped to elect me to office. She moved to Santa Barbara, and we've been in touch occasionally over the years. So that's just very, very special to me. And all of you who've come to say hello and reminded me of things in my distant past that <laughs> where, where you where you had a place. Uh, and I, I couldn't help but think as we are entering the 100th centennial uh, celebration of suffrage of my time at the 50th anniversary of suffrage. It was 1970, Pat Russell, who was my mentor and my role model, if she had not been elected run for and been elected to the LA City Council, I don't know that I ever would have done that. But Pat said we're gonna celebrate the centennial. It was summer, it's August is the actual date. And so I put my children and my three children in the car and we drove down and I remember saying to them, I want you to remember this. I don't know that I'm gonna be around at the 100th. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're gonna be there and I want you to remember it. So when I asked them, they don't remember, <laughs> but I do. And actually, that night, at a special event, uh, some of the original suffragists were there. They were still around in 1970. And I was sitting next to one at this evening event, uh, and uh, I said something about, you really were a suffragette? And she poked me hard. She said, the word is suffragist. So since then, I've never used that other word. And, and one of my, my teachable moments, I have two teachable moments, they're short, I'll give you both of them, is that the word is suffragist, not suffragette, which was used by the media, I don't think they called it that in those days, to put, to put you down. A, a, an et is, is minimizing. And just recently, I said, would you ever call yourself a feminette? And, does, and doesn't that make it clear what suffragette was? The British used that word. I don't talk to them about it. And the, and the other teachable moment <clears throat> is, very long ago, <clears throat> 
I looked in my 12th grade, my son's 12th grade uh, government book to see what it said about women's suffrage. And it said, on August 26, uh, 1920, the 19th Amendment was, 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 was approved and women were given the right to vote. You know nobody gave us anything. We fought for it. We won it. So never you. <laughs> So those are my two teachable moments. Send, the, send them out. Every time you send a letter, put Joyce teachable moments there. Okay. Okay. And then just an, another moment. Uh, it's, it's fun to be the, fun, and the, to be the oldest generation here. Most of my life, I was the youngest person in any group I was in. I graduated high school at 16. I graduated college at 20. So I was always younger than everybody else. And here I am. And you know how old I am? Because they, she told you how long I'd been married. So you add 20 to that, and there you are. And it gives me a couple of extra years there, too. So I'm trying to accept that, especially since I had a birthday this week. <laughs> OK. But why did I run for office? I like to say I was 35 before I knew that women could run for office. I had no role models. The only one, and boy, I think of her a lot lately, is Margaret Chase Smith She from Maine. She was elected to the House of Representatives after her husband died. That certainly wasn't a role I wanted to follow. She was, she was from Maine, the other end of the world. Uh, she was five feet, barely five feet tall. I was taller when I heard about her. Uh, <laughs> she, she was a Republican, and she always wore a rose. She stood up to Joe McCarthy. Boy, that was, that was when you really took notice of Margaret Chase Smith. And I've been saying for the past few years, where is Margaret Chase Smith when we need her? We really need her again. <laughs> So that was hardly a role model for me. I was active always in the League of Women Voters, and also I joined the League, can you believe it, January 1954? That's like 65 years ago. Oh my gosh, wow. <laughs> and uh, I was always active in the League and in American Association of University Women, and the two of them played very important parts in my running for office, and at some point, I was over 35, I said, I'm tired of trying to influence the decision makers. It's time to be a decision maker. And so I ran for office for the first time in 1973. Uh, Los Angeles, until right now, I had a mid midterm election, so to speak. And I, I was, it was strictly grassroots. I had very little money. I raised very little money. When the, you would go for an endorsement and they say, how much is it going to cost you and how much are you going to raise? I would say, I think this campaign will cost me $25,000. And I know 1,000 people who will give me $25 each. And that's pretty much the way the money came in. So, and I didn't know that I had no access to money or to power or, and that it was very important to have that. I was naive and in a sense that helped. So this was a real grassroots campaign. We paid the, we paid the office, we paid the telephone, we paid the printing, we paid the postage and all the people power was volunteered. So uh, <clears throat> I don't think you can do it that way anymore, but I entered that way. I lost the first election. I, there was an, a one-term incumbent. The papers paid no attention to the election whatsoever. I think I had one paragraph in the LA Times and two paragraphs in the four-day-a-week throwaway, the, the green sheet, now the daily news, and you pay, and it's, uh, it's every day. And uh, you made uh, up for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In the, in the press. Oh, later, later, later. And uh, I for there was another strong candidate. We forced the incumbent into a runoff. I came in second. And suddenly there was six weeks, and we had to put another campaign together. And we did that. Going back a little way, and I won't do too much of this, Tom Bradley had run against Sam Yorty in 1969 in a hideously ugly campaign. And Sam Yorty beat him. Tom ran again. The campaign was equally ugly. But Tom was elected at about 10 o'clock that night in a, in a runoff campaign. And my results didn't come in until 2 o'clock. And, and that was uh, the, the, the winning. The, oh, the, and I had lost by 1% of the vote. So that's pretty hard to take, but I resolved I would run again. And four years later, I put together a more sophisticated campaign, was able to raise money. I'd gone to work for the Jewish Federation in LA, doing community relations in the Valley. It was a wonderful job. I learned about fundraising. I met people who gave me money. I met people who endorsed me. It was, it was good. And that time, I ran against the same incumbent, and I beat him. And I have just one special story to tell you. In those days, 
Political dinners were for about $150. An expensive one was $200. My, my opponent gave a luncheon and charged $1,000 a plate for the luncheon. That was an eye-opener. And some wonderful, clever person on my staff <coughs> said, okay, Joy, we're gonna give a fundraising luncheon. It's a brown bag luncheon. And of course, the press ate that up. <laughs> what was in it too? They, it was just a brilliant idea, and I got a lot of publicity. And we have T-shirts, I have one left, and it says, election should be won, not bought. Still relevant, right? Still relevant. <laughs> <clears throat> and <clears throat> one of my themes was, you need a council member who cares. And that's what I tried to do, to represent the people of my district. We, we always had a chip on our shoulder in the San Fernando Valley. And I, and I just wanted to, talk, to make the valley important. It was to me, and I wanted the people who lived in it to be important. I had a wonderful district office staff, Margaret was on that staff, who cared about the people and who worked with them. And I turned out to be a leader in garbage. It, I don't want to go into detail because there are too many people to hear here. But <clears throat> it, the landfills were filling up. It was time to do something about garbage. Uh, and, um, uh, and I met, was a leader in recycling. We have a wonderful Bureau of Sanitation, but the word recycle was not in their heads. They didn't know it. So it took a few years as head of the Public Works Committee to start the recycling program. Now we have to find something else because the rest of the world doesn't want our recyclables anymore. So it's a whole new game. And then because I would see the need uh, and had the opportunity actually for to have a child care center now, the Joy Pikes Child Development Center at City Hall. There'd been efforts to do it, it hadn't been successful. We ha hired a child care coordinator. We got this, this um, child care center with the help of the feds and it's been thriving and wonderful. And Beth has, has um, taken me there a couple of times very recently and it's wonderful to see it. The children there look so happy. They're having the time of their life and I just get such a boost when I'm there and when I see them. There are lots of other things on the way to doing that, things you have control of and you say, this is what I'm going to do, things that come up and you have to deal with them as, as you're there. And I can tell you lots of stories and if there's time, I'll tell you some more of them. What were the obstacles? I can tell you that at the beginning, because I didn't have money, I would stand at the markets on Friday, Friday evenings and on the movie lines and such, and in the bowling alleys, that's where I handed out my little card, and people would take the card and they'd look at the picture of me, and they'd look at me, they'd look down, they'd look at me, and they'd say, that's you, huh? Mm -hmm. And I'd nod and say yes, and they'd say, well, you couldn't do any worse than the guys are doing. <laughs> And I will also say that as I looked back to look at times when I really was discriminated against, I, I didn't see it necessarily at the time. There were such instances, but I, didn't, I wasn't looking for them and I didn't see them. I was, as, as Pat Russell said to me after I was elected, the king is dead, long live the queen. You're one of 15, you vote, as, you all have an equal vote. And so I behaved that way and I responded that way. But I have, one more thing, a couple of years ago, with Wendy Gruel and, and Nuri Martinez, who was the only member of the LA City Council at that time, and now there are two of them, and hopefully there'll be three very shortly, uh, <clears throat> maybe more. <clears throat> uh, we, we did a dog and pony show, and the question was, why aren't there more women on the council and in public life? They really, the number in the state legislature had, had, was down from what it had been at its peak, and why weren't more women running for office? We couldn't come up with a real answer. We really couldn't. But then Donald Trump was elected president, and suddenly there are women in office, more in state legislatures, more in governorships, more holding office, state offices throughout the country, more, of course, by a lot in Congress and in our state legislature. So it's sad that that's what it took, but I don't think it's going to change. I think women understand what it is, the power, the power of being a public official and what you can accomplish when you have goals, when you know what you're doing when you have a good staff working with you, that, that they're never going to change. They're going to continue to see it. And one of these days, hopefully not too long, they'll say, why aren't there more men in public life? <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Joy. <clears throat> Susan. 
I don't think this is this on. Yes. yes. Are we going to go back around again, or we, you want it all now? <laughs> well, you know, it you kind of Beth feels. Beth posed four questions to yeah, us. Yeah, it. It kind There's of a lot to say. feels like, like, yeah, I would just say what's the most important thing for you to I'll say do, because right. we do have a lot of ground okay. to cover. And other people to share yeah. with, sure. So uh, I, following Joy, I don't know where to begin, but to say that she was my mentor. Maybe I should start there. So I was in City Hall in L.A. from 1985 to 1991, and... Joy was there before and after me for a total of how many years? Sixteen. Sixteen. So she is. She was my mentor, and it's the only one I've ever had. So I'm very proud to share the podium with her tonight. I'm proud. I'm proud. <laughs> uh, and there was, by the way, she taught me the lesson about suffragette and suffragist. I use the word suffragette all the time, and I never would say feminine. So I, I consider myself a feminist. So I learned that lesson very early from Joy. But um, my own uh, path to uh, elected office really begins with my daughters, and maybe that happens to a lot of women. Um, when they were very young and they were in preschool and coming home from school and reading these very sexist textbooks, uh, there was a series that Harper and Rowe, I still remember the company, put out called Janet and Mark. And that was the name of the two children in the, in the book. And you always saw Janet with an apron in, in the kitchen with her mom baking. And you saw the little boy in the garage, usually with tools, with his father. And there were certainly no people of color in those books. And so at the time, I was living in Ventura. And I had joined the National Organization for Women. And I learned very quickly early on that in order to make a difference, women had to have a seat at the table. So I then joined a group called the National Women's Political Caucus. And we went and we lobbied that school board down in Ventura to change the textbooks, and we were successful. So my very first time out in politics, we were successful. And it was the beginning of my thinking where w women needed to be. They had to be at the table. Um, and I learned then, because the w one of the women on the city, um, uh, one on the school board was the woman who listened to what we had to say and led the effort to change the textbooks. So uh, watching how she acted on, on the school board made me realize that we needed more women on the other side of the table. And I use the expression gender equity a lot because that's one of the things that's driven me over the years. Um, I, I worked for many, many years to help other women get into public office. I did, I am proudly, uh, and Luce is the current chair, I'm proudly the, one of the founding mothers of the Santa Barbara Women's Political Committee, whose challenge is to elect more women to office and to have gender equity. Um, one of the passions that I had, or one of the issues that um, I focused on when I was young and coming up, and Joy didn't mention this en enough, was childcare. And so I was a single parent for a while. I had a terrible time finding after school care. And uh, while I was in City Hall, Joy and Pat Russell called me into the office one day. We've been reminiscing about this over the last year or so, and basically pointed a finger at me and said, you're going to do a child care policy, Susan. And it was one of the things I'm most proud of. Joy and Pat led the effort on the council. My job was to make it happen in the community and to put it together. And um, I still remember the day that it passed in City Hall. If anybody's ever been to LA City Hall, it's huge, the council chambers. And it was full that day, uh, people standing there because they wanted to see that vote pass. And there was a city councilman from southern uh, s south L.A., and he had his two-year-old little daughter on the, on the table. And he said, I asked him why, and he said, I want to be able to tell her years later that she was here when we passed a child care policy. So uh, I sat in the back crying because I was so <laughs> happy of what had happened. And then, of course, Joy has mentioned the child care center. So we did a lot of work on child care and family and work issues, which stayed with me, and, and which I'll tell you in a minute, has stayed with me over the years. So I finally ran for office many years later after encouraging women to run them, other women to run, because I really was concerned about an issue in the community, issues in our community. And I think that's more often than not why women run. You hear the stories about, oh, it's a stop sign or something else like that. Well, for me, it was air, it was, excuse me, pollution in our oceans. And there was a period in the late 1990s where they were close, public health was closing the beaches and there was a lot of pollution in our oceans. And nobody seemed to be doing much about it. There was a woman incumbent who was not making the effort to make a difference. 
And so I ran against her, I challenged her, and I won. But it was a hard campaign to do. I had never run for office before. But the good thing for me was I knew how to win an election because I'd done it, I'd worked on so many other campaigns. But that was the beginning of my, um, my career in public office. I also, besides gender equity, I too believe that we women have to be role models for the other young women and young boys in our community growing up. And I know also from my generation, women often started much later in life. We felt we had to raise our children, maybe uh, have a career. I didn't start till my late 50s. The good news is there are many young women now running for office, and that makes me very happy. So what did I aim to achieve? That was a question Beth asked us. I wanted uh, our voices to be heard. I wanted women's voices as part of what I describe as gender e equity. And I think my, our, my and our agenda is different. Uh, I've heard uh, uh, Janet talk about public health versus public, uh, uh, how did, what it was? A, human, infrastructure. human infrastructure. Uh, and there's so many of those issues that were not uh, part of the agenda, at least on the County Board of Supervisors. So I, I worked very hard, and where I was coming from, what I wanted to change was the focus on local neighborhoods. So by the time I got through with eight years, I'd managed to find 200 acres to preserve for uh, open space, uh, focused on saving a, a, this is the kind of thing you can do when you're in office and you can wrap your arms around it and make a difference. And you, if you have the right staff to help you too. The Page Youth Center was about to go bankrupt, we saved that. Uh, homelessness is a passion of mine to this day. We created the Safe Parking Program. The city of Goleta happened while I was on board. A whole lot of things like that where you could make a difference in your local community. I also believe really strongly in gender equity on boards and commissions and believe to this day, and I see uh, a, a member of the, uh, the Commission on the Status of Women, Suzanne Peck, who was part of that effort. We did a lot of that in Los Angeles, worked to make sure there was a difference uh, in the, the equity and boards and commissions. Another way, another thing that made a difference for me or what I tried to do is, and I think all women do business differently in public office. So I did a lot of town hall meetings. I did district tours. I created a natural resources advisory committee to engage my, the, the staff and the kind of work that really mattered to me. So once again, I think we in office make a difference in not only being there and being role models, but uh, also, um, how we talk and how we communicate with our, com with our constituents. I did find some barriers. Uh, I found, I don't know, I can't ask, I don't know about Janet's experience on the Board of Supervisors, but when those doors closed and we went into exec session, it was very hard not to be taken seriously. And when I was a minority the last two years, and I know so many women who have had this experience, you, you make a statement, you propose something, and you're ignored, and the next thing, the man down at the end of the table is proposing the same thing, and everybody's going, yay, yay. So that happened to me a lot when I was on, on, in office. Um, the issue all along of balancing work and family, which I first learned working with Joy in City Hall, became a passionate interest of mine, and here's where you can do something when you're in office. I was in charge of three staff members, it was four of us, and I set the way we did business in my office. So flex time, child care, coming and going if you had a sick child. There was a whole range of things we did because during that time, two of the women in my office gave birth, and I had grandchildren. So creating and defining a, a, a work, a family-friendly office was what, one of the things I'm most proud of that I did when, it was, when I was on the Board of Supervisors. But that's not the kind of thing you talk about in your legacy. It's the kind of thing you share with your friends. And so I know I made a difference for the women who worked for me during that time. Um, many of you are in the art committee are aware of a period of, uh, uh, how to say this politely, the current leadership of the Santa Barbara News Press and when it was first taken over and how it's changed. <laughs> Janet's laughing. So if you were here during the late 90s and early 2000s, you need to know that women in public office were targets. Uh, the current owner and the, the owner then and now made us uh, a target of her editorial page on a regular basis. That was pretty hard. Getting up in the morning, getting the news press. We had a little running routine, my husband and I. The door would open, he'd go out and get the newspaper. I'd be kind of waiting and he'd, the door would close and he'd say, you're not gonna like it today, Susan. 
or it's okay, Susan, nothing, nothing negative in today's newspaper. So those are really tough times. Women can be targets. I, mean, I don't have to say more than the Katie Hill thing that's just occurred, uh, which is tragic. I would like to save the last part of what I want to say, Beth, because mm -hmm. I have a list of things that I'd like to advise, use as advice. Okay. But if it's all right with you, I'd like to do that at the end. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Janet, you're on. Thanks. Please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Beth, and thank you to um, the League for inviting me and, and for having this important panel. You know, I've had, um, it's been, we're in November, so it's been 11 months that I've been speaking, um, speaking out, and I, it, it, it's almost uncomfortable for me. There's a, a part of me that kind of liked not having to talk. Um, I spent 24 years um, talking and voicing my opinion, and so I will say um, that, that there is something a little bit, um, it's, it's a little nice right now, um, but it doesn't mean that I don't have an opinion and, and that I'm not strident in, in my opinions. Um, I, when we talk about um, people who have influenced us, um, it's given me pause, and I, there's so many people, so many people in this room that have, but I, I'd like to go back to my dad. Um, his name was Harry. He was a high school teacher at Inglewood High School, and we lived in, in Los Angeles when I grew up. Um, he was a, um, a, he taught for over 35 years, and he taught uh, industrial arts, and he was the chair of his department. He was also the teacher union president for many years, and he fought um, as, a, as a president for tenure for teachers. And I recall as a young girl um, having the, the teachers come to our home and they would talk about negotiations and there were phone calls at that time, which seems so strange to me being on the school board, but there were these interactions at that time with um, the teachers and school board members trying to negotiate contracts over the telephone. Um, and, and, and there was a sense that the teachers in the school board um, didn't like each other, there wasn't respect amongst each other, amongst the two groups, and, and so I, I kind of carried that, that with me. Also during that time, my dad was, um, he, he taught the leadership class at Englewood High School. And the leadership class had decided that they were going to put up the United Nations flag along with the United States flag and the flag of California as they had this big ceremony at Inglewood High School. And the next day, a group of parents came to the principal and wanted my dad fired uh, for, for, dare, for daring to, um, to encourage the students to put up the United Nations flag. Well, that, was, that took on a, um, the, the conversation surrounding that was huge. And again, I was a young girl really in the background um, watching this, not reflecting at all at the time what impact it had on me. Because I grew up um, with two older brothers. Um, I was not interested in politics growing up. I was a cheerleader in high school at Westchester High School. Um, I went on, as you heard, um, got married fairly young, had families, started um, my, my business. And it was always my husband who was interested in politics. It, was, it wasn't me. Um, and I'm embarrassed to say I don't even know, I don't think I knew who my supervisor was at the time, but I did know that it was important to elect women. Um, and so when we had a school board election, uh, there was a list of candidates, and I uh, naively, I will say, voted for the woman, and she was elected. This was the Santa Barbara School Board. Well, that... Um, that woman who I supported um, was part of the Eagle Forum. Uh, many of you may remember that, um, a very far right group. And um, my older daughter at the time was in junior high school, so she was, um, that was her, the school board. And at that time, this particular school board member sent out flyers through the Friday folders that many of us would see when our kids would come home from school that contained some religious information. And it was shocking. It was shocking to me. And, and again, I, now I go, I'm going back to my dad because I think about 
what I learned from him about the importance of public education, that it is for everyone. It is free and it is for everyone. There should not be uh, political overtones, religious overtones. It, um, so when I saw this, and mind you, I had never even been to a PTA meeting. I was a PTA member, but I hadn't even been to a PTA meeting. Well, that flyer got me so enraged. Um, I spoke to another uh, friend, and the two of us went to a school board meeting. And we didn't really even know what we were doing, but um, they told us to speak during public comment, and we did. And of course, they couldn't take action because it was public comment, but this particular initiative got was in the newspaper. This was before um, the, the time Susan was talking about. And um, so people started coming up to me and my friend and um, you know we were really excited that it got the press and, and then the school board decided to pass a resolution that these types of things couldn't happen and, and it just it, it, was, it was very exciting for me. So that was the end of the story. Well then um, there was an opening on the Goleta School Board, a different school district. And my husband, um, who actually was here earlier today and he left, um, he uh, encouraged me to run. And he said, this is the time that you should, if you're interested in school district policy or policies, um, that this is the time because there's no incumbent running. So um, it was a Friday afternoon. Um, it was during Fiesta. My husband and I were down on State Street and having a margarita, and it was a quarter to five. I had to decide at that moment. I had 15 minutes to decide if I was going to run for office. <laughs> so I had my last gulp of a, of a margarita and came down to the elections office and put my name down. And I was one of four people um, who, who, um, who was planning to run for this position. And the next day, the newspaper wrote about all four candidates. And I was so unknown. I just had my little family and my business. I was, they had these, I'll never forget when you talk about paragraphs, glowing paragraphs of my three um, opponents and probably three lines about me. <laughs> I was a mother, I was a vocational consultant, and that was about it. Well, I, long story short, I won, I won that race. Two people dropped out, and I won. And, um, and then I ran two more times. Um, I absolutely loved being on the school board. It was such an important time to be on the school board. We had parents who were coming, and I'm sure you've heard these stories, but literally coming into our libraries and pulling books off of our shelves and um, our superintendent having to go to the school, to go to their homes and get the, get the books back. We had to enact policies about how parents could come into the classroom or not come into the classroom because what we were seeing is parents during circle time would come in and interrupt the circle time because they believed that there was psychological indoctrination going on. It was a heady time in, in the school districts in the, in the 1990s, and I was so happy and so proud to be a member of the school board and be a member of that particular school board. Um, we all worked incredibly well together. We, even though there were disagreements, we had the same um, important values, and that was the value and the importance of public education. And also the value of our, which I cared about so much, not just because my dad was a teacher, I was a teacher too, but the value of the professionals um, in our schools, whether it be the teachers or the aides or the bus drivers or the custodians, everyone played a role in the school district, and I so supported our employees. And, you know, there were... Um, accomplishments throughout my 12 years on the school board. Um, but as we all know, one person can't get things done. You need to develop um, relationships with your board members. And I know uh, Luz will, I, I think the Goleta School Board is, is very special and it continues to be that way because of, of people like Luz who, who are on the board and, and just reflect that sense of community that we are all in this together and we care so much about our children. But the fact is, and what I found and what I learned about um, all these wonderful things, and we 
We passed the bond measure. We rebuilt Isla Vista School. We fixed up the exterior of our schools, and we put a lot of money into special education and um, the, the textbooks. We, you know, we had great opportunities for everyone to come together and look at our textbooks. We listened to our teachers. It was a great time. But what I found was is that there was more to be done for our for our children. So where, what is the next step? Who, who else can help besides just the school district? And, and to me, that next level was the county. And, and that was um, Susan's position. And when Susan decided that she was going to retire, I decided that I was going to step up and, and run for supervisor. So by this time, you can imagine, I was no more the cheerleader uh, in, in those. I, I, was, I felt like I was a fighter. And um, because I had gone through 12 years on the school board, and I, I shouldn't say I was, maybe I wasn't fighting, but I was just advocating. I was a hard advocate for, for my beliefs. And I wanted to carry that forward on the Board of Supervisors. And the Board of Supervisors has so much control and so much power, and they oversee um, a very large budget that is so much of it is or could be focused on um, the most vulnerable in our community, or again, as I termed it, the human infrastructure, because there seemed to be such a focus on, and not to demean or um, not not see it as important, but the the building infrastructure. There was a sense of so much money going toward buildings and uh, roads, and of course that's important. Who in elected office would say that that's not important and that we need to take care of those things? Certainly, my constituents wanted their potholes fixed and their trees trimmed, so that's not even a question. The question I always posed was, we cannot forget the people who need our help in the county. And then that, so it wasn't just handouts of money, it was making sure that we had our social service department fully staffed so that when people wanted to see a social worker or a mental health worker or a public health worker, they didn't have to wait weeks to get help, that, there were, that, that we had enough staff to make sure that those, um, those people were on hand to take care of them. So I was very passionate about um, taking care of our community. I was very, um, I was very concerned about public health and safety. Um, during my term as supervisor, I, I've actually lost count. I think we had seven or eight fires um, in the county. And when I first uh, became a board member, we were working out of a little trailer um, in one of our county parking lots. And when I realized during one of the first fires that I was supervisor that we were working out of this trailer and it took an hour to get our phone systems set up and the very early rudimentary computer system set up, I realized that time in an emergency is of the essence and, you, and that hour is a missed hour of important communication to the community. So we had the opportunity to open a new emergency operations center. Now, thanks to Susan and the prior board, they had set aside some money um, to do just that. And we also had someone from the community who was willing to gift the county money, um, a, a large sum of money to open an emergency operations center. But there happened to be some resistance of a few board members that maybe we shouldn't spend the money to, to do this. And here I was just talking about infrastructure, Excuse right? Me. Yet I was the champion of this emergency operations center, huge infrastructure. But I felt like it was, um, we, Absol there was no doubt in my mind that we needed to have a state-of-the-art emergency operations center. And so for me, that was, um, that was huge. And Janet? also, again, I go Excuse back me. to supporting our employees. So I um, you. think it's time to stop. Yeah, and, it's so, um, it is so hard to do. I, I hope know. you know how hard you know, this is. You know, it's funny because usually Wonderful there might stories. be someone down here with a timer, you know, that'll put up the red yeah. flag. So thank you for speaking yeah, up. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, yeah. I'm done. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Passing the baton <laughs> elegantly to Elise.
Well, we share the baton. I, I like that better. Um, thank you. I'm so happy uh, to be here today. I think to, to begin to answer the question of why I ran, um, it's really because I believe very strongly in public service. And I believe public service can take many different roles. I think much of the work that the League of Women Voters does is in service of the public, so I thank you for that. Um, and I believe very strongly in public education. Uh, so when there was, as you heard from my bio, an, an opening for an appointment uh, to the Goleta School Board, um, I, I remember seeing it in the newspaper. And just in passing, thinking, oh, I want, you know, somebody, I hope somebody really good runs for that. <laughs> and I think the story of many women who end up in public office is you have to be asked many times <laughs> or encouraged many times. And I found that encouragement from the Women's Political Committee um, and from other women in the community and from my spouse. Um, I know we've talked about, others have talked about that. Um, my husband, Diego, is my number one fan. Um, and he is someone who is an equal partner in all things, an equal parent, and always says yes when I have a crazy idea or uh, something more that I want to take on or more that I want to accomplish. Um, and that plays a big role um, in why I'm able to do um, all the things that I, I love and enjoy doing. Um, so running for office, then once I was um, so fortunate to be appointed, um, was another big, scary thing. Um, I actually found out that I was pregnant right after I was appointed. <laughs> so that was an, another obstacle to go through. So I like to say my children have been with me from the very beginning. Um, so uh, that was a, a big uh, leap to, to think about how to run a campaign, how do you get endorsements, how do you fundraise. Um, and I had organizations like the Women's Political Committee and other groups here um, in our wonderful community that were very encouraging and were helpful with both practical tips of how to do that and just the daily encouragement um, that it takes to run a campaign. Um, but I think one of the beautiful things about being a local elected official is that particularly through the election and campaigning process, you get to meet um, the people that you are uh, wanting to serve. You knock on a lot of doors, you make a lot of phone calls, and you hear directly from residents what they're concerned about, what they're worried about, what their, goal, their goals are for, um, in my case, public education. And I have really found to highly enjoy that, that aspect of, of running for office. Um, I think another thing that I want to say is something that um, I think about often is you can't be what you can't see. Um, so you heard that I'm the first uh, Latina elected to the Goleta School Board. Um, almost half of the students in our district um, are low income or, or students of color uh, or Latino students. Um, so that was particularly meaningful for me to be someone who could be a voice for that community um, and be accessible to that community. Um, I make my cell phone available to any parent who wants to contact me. I'm bilingual, um, and that's something that I take great pride in, being accessible to those families. And having my lived experience as being a low-income student, being an English learner, which we have many in our district, um, and I'm just honored to represent the 30 3,500 kids um, in, our, in our district. Um, one other uh, thing that I want to mention, and I do want to leave plenty of time for the two amazing women next to me, um, I think one thing that is a, or a couple things that are guiding principles for me when I think about obstacles that might come up um, in elected office. I think something that is um, an obstacle, if you want to describe it that way, is that there are always emerging issues that come up that you may not have anticipated or thought about when you were campaigning or when you were thinking about that particular um, office. And I think then it really comes back to who you are as a person and what kind of leader you want to be. And for me, um, I know that something that's an echo to what Janet said, um, as someone who is in a governing role or a policy-making role, you don't do things on your own. You can't, that's not how things work. 
So you have to be able to build relationships with people, whether it's your, your fellow board members or council members, um, or the people in your community that you represent. So I feel very strongly in uh, when issues come up, listening, doing the research, collaborating, uh, working with others, developing a plan, and then uh, communicating what that plan is or why you're making decisions that you are, that you are um, when you're on that dais. Um, I think those are, in many ways, the aspects of what makes a woman um, elected official. Um, and I know that the women that I'm up here with, that has featured in their, in their roles, um, in their uh, respective offices. Um, you don't do this alone, um, and you really need to have that collaboration um, with others that you serve with. Um, I know that I find uh, a lot of encouragement and support from um, other elected officials in our community, which we are so fortunate to have so many wonderful women and feminist men. Um, I know in my role, um, I work closely with council members in Goleta, with our county supervisors, um, and even our state representatives. And that's, I think, a really wonderful part of the work that we have done as a community. And I know the work that I continue to do with the Women's Political Committee to build um, that, that human infrastructure of uh, future feminist office holders, um, all in service of our community. So thank you. Thank you. I, I have a little different story. Um, I was, I'll, I'll get to why I ran for office, but I was, I was raised in Los Angeles with a single mom, working mom, who's here, um, without childcare. We were latchkey generation in the 70s and 80s, as many of us were. Um, I think I developed an early interest in science. I've been giving this a lot of thought. But I think mainly because it couldn't be devalued or questioned. I think in, a, in those 70s and times when it's whoever spoke the loudest or the strongest or pushed the hardest is who's right. Um, I was not a fighter in that way, but I knew I was right about a lot of things. And I think I have found that math and science gave me a way to just quietly have a view and have it be acknowledged without having to fight loudly for things. But having that interest in science past elementary school turned me into a fighter because what happens past elementary school and once you get into higher level classes in high school and particularly in college pursuing science majors, I, I ended up majoring in geophysics, the, the classes were 90% male and then they're not only louder and more uh, pushy with their answers, but they're also right a lot of the time, too. And I think I had to find a way to find my voice and to just stay steady. And I think when it gets to advice, there, there are always people who are going to push harder or be louder um, or tell you the reasons you can't do things. But that early training I feel that I had in just being steady and being present, even when there are a lot of forces uh, sort of buffering about um, is a really important part of finding our voice and not being silenced as that moves on. Um, I think w when I did decide to run for office, it sort of came to me. I didn't know any elected officials. I hadn't been part of any um, particular organizations, which I'm so grateful to be part of now. Um, but I attended the March for Science, and it had never occurred to me before that that I was qualified or could run for office. And um, there was a, a local uh, speaker who said that people with science background should consider running for office. And this was also in this wave of women running for office, but also in climate change, which is truly, I believe, the existential crisis of our times. I mean, even in the 70s in elementary school, we learned about greenhouse gases and global warming. It's, it's like, astonishing to me that so many decades have gone by that that hasn't been fully addressed. So at the March for Science, there was this sort of, you know, call that that uh, people with science backgrounds should consider running. So I still didn't know that I had people, resources I could turn to. I went to the internet. I looked on the web page. I looked at the deadlines and the process. And I sort of steadily went about my business by myself. And the first person I met was the, then at the time Mayor Helene Schneider. 
and um, someone else made the introduction. I was so nervous to meet her. I was sitting with the mayor, and um, she asked, well, how, how, much, how much do you think this campaign will cost? How much do you have? And I was like, well, I think, oh, $5,000. I think we can do $5,000. And she laughed hysterically, <laughs> like, oh, no, no, that will not do. And um, so I learned very much on the job of campaigning and growing my message through meeting with people. And there are many in this room who are also really instrumental. Sheila Lodge met with me early on, Lois Capps, Janet Wolf, Susan Rose, and um, also Helene Schneider and, and Hannah Beth Jackson. And, and um, they took me seriously. And that was um, a real boost to moving forward. And I had a little bit of different interests. To me still, climate change is our biggest issue. And, and I think you heard from my bio or the things that I'm, I, I tend to gravitate toward are the things that will help us address this crisis. I'm very concerned about our city's resilience, uh, our, our fire seasons being not just a season anymore, but year round, our, our extreme climate events. We don't have just extreme drought, but these atmospheric rivers and flooding and debris flows. Um, I was sworn in on the day of the Montecito debris flow, and all of that informs every decision that I make is, what are we doing for our planning, for our safety, for our clean water, our water supplies, for our fire issues, but our climate change, how are we making choices for different energy use, for different sources of water. Um, I think the biggest barrier that has um, come up and all along the way is that there will always be people who will say you can't do what it is you want to do. And going back to my feminist mom died in the wool, feminist upbringing, she would always just say, well, why not? And um, it's really hard to come up with an answer. Well, why not? And when I was uh, getting unsure about running, she'd say, well, wh why not? Why, why wouldn't you do that? And, and I remember very young that question being, well, why, why not? Why not you? Why not you be the one? And that is something that loops through just constantly, that decision making. And um, since we do, we are women, and, and we do talk about childcare and, and those issues too, I have to say, that also in that um, early part of my education, when I was in getting my master's degree and um, had my first child, our first child, my husband and I made a spreadsheet of, of uh, in 15 minute increments of who was on baby duty. So it was uh, very clearly delineated, he's here too. Um, and we were both in graduate school and we we're both trying to achieve our goals and childcare is very much everybody's issue. It is not just a women's issue anymore. And it's a, it's a family issue that needs to be addressed with everyone, and it takes everybody stepping up. But that expectation that we're all involved in that has carried through, and there's, there's no possible way I could be in office and teaching and doing all that I do without that shared responsibility. And that's an expectation I think we all need to just have and carry um, forward, and that becomes a barrier if we don't have that expectation for ourselves and for our community that that is, it, our children are all of our children. They're our, our future leaders also. Um, I didn't come as a, as a natural leader, but I think when it comes to decision making, I have learned that I much rather be the person with the vote and um, to, to be there, I have to keep showing up and doing that. It's, it's a very powerful, privileged position to be in, to be a decision maker. And I think one of our biggest responsibilities is to listen and, and to, to take input from our whole community and to really try to integrate that into all of our decisions for, for everyone. Um, I think, I think I'll Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> Gloria, our youngest and from furthest afield except for Joy from North County. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and um, thank you for allowing me to be here today. It's truly an honor. Um, why I decided to run for office? Well, 
Santa Maria has been known as one of the most conservative parts of the Central Coast, um, definitely the most conservative part of Santa Barbara County. And when I decided to run, my main goal was really to change the narrative of how we talk about Santa Maria and Santa Marians. Um, I know my community really well, and I know that the leadership I, did, does, still does not reflect um, the values of my community. And so when the opportunity came to serve and be in this position, I couldn't say no. I knew that it was imperative for someone with my own lived experiences um, to be in this position. Um, as I was you know, debating whether or not I was even capable to take on this challenge, um, a really good friend of mine said, you know, we need people in power who don't want to be. Those are the people that we need to be supporting. And it was in that moment that I, I realized that I was on the right path. Um, and from the get-go, I experienced so many barriers and challenges. People within my own progressive group, within our own progressive community, doubting whether my win would even be possible because here you have a 29-year-old brown woman who works for Planned Parenthood running in a conservative part of the county, running in Santa Maria. How is that possible? How is she going to win when she has a country club in her district and she's running against an incumbent who can very easily write himself a $10,000 check for his campaign? Um, so I knew from the very beginning that I was going to have to not just fight for this position, not just for myself, but for the community that I wanted, for the communities that I wanted to represent in Santa Maria. I did this thinking about my niece the whole way. My niece is a four, at the time she was four years old, and um, she's indigenous. She, um, unfortunately, um, her parents haven't always been able to be with her, and so if, if I've had, um, the cards stacked against me. I mean, she, she has it more so. And I, I remember thinking, and I still think, you know, I never want her to believe that there isn't anything that she cannot do. And when we achieve for ourselves, we achieve for others as well, because we are able to make it known that um, it's possible that if my win was possible, their wins are also possible. Um, you know, I went into this campaign wanting to represent people like my parents, my mom and dad, uh, my family, and every decision that I make as an elected official now is keeping in mind um, people like my family who are the most vulnerable in our, in our community, immigrants, farm workers, people who don't understand, who don't speak English, who are monolingual, who are barely making ends meet and are on survival every day. And being the only progressive on the Santa Maria City Council has definitely um, ha has had its challenges. Um, you know, campaigning was definitely one of the most life-changing experiences. You know, it was the first time I can say that I experienced blatant racism to my face and sexism. I remember when I was first asked, when I, when I asked, uh, my first ask for an endorsement, um, I was told, well, yeah, you may get some votes because you're good looking. Um, and having that be my first experience asking for an endorsement was, was, was a tough hit to take. And um, I knew that I had to prove this not just to myself, not just to my family, but to also, um, you know, all of our residents and those who also, you know, who, who had a hard time envisioning someone like me in this position. And so as, again, the only progressive on the Santa Maria City Council, um, that's also been really challenging. Oftentimes I ask myself, how can I, you know, I've worked so hard to earn a, a seat at the table. I mean, I'm so proud of the campaign that we, ran, that we ran, and I never stopped working on that campaign. And, you know, you work so hard to earn a seat at the table, and when you're there, you're still not being listened to. Oftentimes, I'm the only woman in a meeting. 
oftentimes I'm 30 years younger than everybody else, and oftentimes I'm the only person of color. And to have to, have to think about, okay, if I sit at this side of the table, will they see me now? If I speak this way, how do, what's my posture? What, what am I, what's my attire going to be for the day? I mean, having to think about that is exhausting, um, but I also recognize that it's so important for more women, more women of color, more young women to run for these positions because it's the only way that we're going to be able to uplift all of the voices of our communities. And so, you know, I am so proud to be able to represent um, the residents of Santa Maria, um, to be able to fight for issues um, that have, have not been brought to the table before. And even though, again, I, I, I've been one to four, it's been really fascinating to see that with community, with the help of media oftentimes, um, we are able to make changes happen. I mean, Santa Maria just joined on to Monterey Bay Community um, Joint Powers, which is a huge win. We are able to provide the residents of Santa Maria with carbon-free energy now um, and also reducing costs of, of electrical bills for, for all of our residents. That's when that um, was almost didn't happen, um, to be able to really focus on affordable housing and be a strong advocate for that has also been, um, you know, a challenge, but we've also had a lot of accomplishments that I'm incredibly proud of. Um, you know, advice that I would give to others is don't wait for an invitation to act. Once you know what you want and you know why you want it, you have to go after it. Um, and even though I was really fortunate to have people, you know, even though I had people who didn't believe in me, I also had a lot of people who did. And um, I'm, I'm really privileged for, for that, and I'm so, so grateful. But um, I, I don't want my experience or the experience of these wonderful women up here to be the only ones. We need to have more women in power, and um, we need to do everything that we can, not just within our communities, but also supporting those in other communities, our neighboring cities, because, um, you know, it, it affects all of us. Thank you all so much. We are going to allow the uh, audience an opportunity to ask some questions of our speakers, and I'm hoping, Susan, you'll have an opportunity to chime in with the final comments you wanted to make during this Q&A. We're going to take, let's start with 10 minutes of Q&A, and we'll see where, where we go from there. You guys touched on the point. First of all, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to have you inspire us. Um, one of the questions that I have is related to how have you, or how do you recommend us to deal with racism, sexism? What are the, the techniques that you have used to address those situations with your head high and not let, not give those people the power so that it affects you at a deeper level? Thank you. I have a good response Thank for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, actually, something Gloria said reminded me of, um, you know, when I'm out cam campaigning in each of my campaigns, I have to say there were several doors that I knocked on and was confused by the housekeeper or the person who answered the door thought I was the housekeeper. Um, and I'm a very proud uh, daughter of a uh, mom and grandmother who, who were domestic workers. So in each of those examples, um, I remember saying something like, um, no, that's not me, although I hope that you're paying them a fair wage. Um, <laughs> but, but let me talk to, I'm here to talk to you about the school district. Um, do you have children in the district? So I think that's one way to do it. And I'll be honest, it's hard to have that happen to you. Um, but after a couple times, I, I had that you know, immediate response ready. 
Um, and I think the way that we start to combat it is by having more women, um, and, and more women, more women of color, more men of color, and more feminist men who are willing to uplift each other, um, work with each other, support each other, and to Gloria's point, taking all the great success that I, I believe that we have had here in South County to other parts of the county and to other parts of our area, um, because I think the more more of us that there are, um, the more that we can start um, breaking down uh, those instances of, of discrimination and racism. I wanted to add something. Uh, when I was elected to the Board of Supervisors, I don't know if anybody would remember, but we were there were four women on the Board of Supervisors. It's been two most of the time since then. Uh, and I, was, I, I do recall, of the four, three of us are progressives, so those were wonderful times, really wonderful. <laughs> But it really made a difference having four women on the Board of Supervisors, this, the culture, the dialogue. And it was a long time after that that the, the CEO, CAO, whatever he was at the time, he always called everybody Madam Supervisor. He couldn't get past the <laughs> mister. But tell me, I, I agree with, Lou, with, with what Lou says, numbers make the difference. Thank you. I'll just say um, just a couple things. I think it, also, it depends on the setting. And... Um, and how, how you pick your battles. So when I was running for supervisor, um, I'll just, this is one example, this one gentleman said he didn't like the lipstick I was wearing. And um, I said to him, well, you know, I have three daughters that have always complained about my lipstick, so I don't take this so personally. Um, but, um, but that was just on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, kind of interpersonal thing. But on the dais, when you are in public and you have the TV cameras on you and everyone's wa watching, um, there can be slights of hand, sexism, um, discounting what you might say. And um, there are, are, I think, different ways to approach it. One is to respond directly. Um, and one thing that, that I had done is oftentimes speak with the person after the meeting and ex explain to them that they're be it's kind of like I'm the mom in me, that behavior is unacceptable, and um, don't do it again. Uh, pretty simple. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Any, anyone else want to comment? I, I would just, I'm just going to um, thank you for the question. You know, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. Um, it's, it's definitely a challenge, but for me, what what I think about after that, those incidences is, okay, we need to infiltrate. We, we just can't focus on, you know, the top of the ticket, right? We need to infiltrate in commissions, school boards. We need our people everywhere. Because oftentimes when I've experienced, again, that sexism, that racism, it's usually in meetings with other commissioners, with other cabinet members, with other committee members. And so it's really about making sure that we are supporting and elevating individuals so that they can take on positions of power at every level. Thank you. Do you have another question? At one time, the state of Arizona wanted the city of Los Angeles to partner with them in developing a nuclear power plant at the Salt River, which is in Arizona. I guess I was chair of the committee that dealt with water and power at the time. So a group of us, some water and power staff, the mayor, me, uh, a commissioner to flew to, to Phoenix, and then we helicoptered to the Salt River site. Uh, it was a long helicopter ride. And when we got there, uh, they're courting us. They wanted to be good to, and nice to us. He took a look at me and he said, you can't go on this tour with open-toed shoes. They were mushrooms. They weren't fancy shoes. They were comfort <laughs> shoes, but they were open-toed. I said, no one said anything about, about, not, about wearing closed-toed shoes. I said, I am a council member. I didn't make this trip to sit and wait while you took these well, they took the rest of the people on a tour. I let him have it. I was so angry, <laughs> so angry. Fortunately, a very wise secretary or assistant went and got, found a pair of sneakers in which fit, and I wore them, and everything was happy. But the ice was so cold on that tour and the rest of the trip for their having blown it, and I haven't given it, what, given him what he deserved. And, and I was legendary in water and power for some time. <laughs> the, the, the other thing that happened on that same trip, as we got into the elevator to go up to, to our room, and I think we must have all been on the same floor, like the sixth floor. I got in, and there was a big, burly man in there smoking a cigar. 
And I forgot where I was. I said, you can't smoke that in here. And he said, says who? <laughs> and confronted me. And fortunately, a good-sized uh, staff member from Water and Power stood between us and the elevator arrived at the sixth floor and we got out. But that, that whole visit was quite legendary for some time. <laughs> well, we had no smoking in elevators and then in stores and then in the workplace and then in restaurants. That was the hardest of all. But, uh, and I... Again, my role in those cases was to support the, the council member, male, who was, you know, who, who initiated and worked for the things that were important to me. That was one of them. Uh, um, campaign reform what, that led by Mike Wu was another one. But it's important to, to be part of that, not only to initiate what's important, but to work with the, with the people who are leading that role. So, nice. I'll make a Please. short comment on that one also. Um, what I, I think back to what I was saying earlier is just be present. Do not be sent away, no matter who is trying to send you away. And I can give one example of that in graduate school, and I was nine months pregnant and working away at my desk and doing my thing. And um, not my graduate advisor, but a different professor pulled my husband aside, who was also in the program, took him aside and said, you need to take her home. She should be at home. I know, this is right? Shocking. And he said, uh, she does what she wants. <laughs> and, and I stayed. But there's often that pressure to silence yourself or to dismiss yourself. And do not be complicit with those requests of you. Just stand firm, even if it's quietly, to just stay present. I want to give a shout out to Nancy Pelosi, who was such a model of a woman in government. And Nancy keeps her cool no matter what people are saying about her, no matter what is happening around her. She never raises her voice. She never speaks ill of, of, of anybody. She is just such a model. And then she dresses dreamily in those wonderful colors all the time. And I, I just so admire Nancy. My favorite quote is she said, I had five children and nine grandchildren. She said, I know a temper tantrum when I see one. <laughs> Never raises her voice. Wow. Okay. Um, last call for any questions. I can take one more. Okay. All right. So um, thank you all so much for sharing your stories, for, for your service, for your commitment to community, and to celebrating um, women and our families and our democracy. Please help me with a round of applause. I also, oh, I'm sorry, Susan, did you have your? Um, I asked Beth if I could make a, uh, just give you a list. One of our questions was to give advice to others, and I took that to heart, and I was thinking a lot about it. And I don't know who here in the audience is thinking about running for office, because I think we'd love it if you would, or just being more engaged in the public se uh, sector. But I, I have a couple of pieces of advice I'd like to share with you. Um, and I work a lot with a group called Emerge, which recruits and trains women to run for office. So the first thing I would suggest is if you could find a mentor, and if you're lucky, find another Joy, or ask Joy what she's doing. Um, <laughs> she mentors. She just mentors, call me. Just right. Call me. You come to lunch. There you are. You heard it. She's inviting you to lunch. Um, um, one on one. Go if you are again going down this. Thinking about this, do a training. There, the Women's Political Community does it here in town. Emerge does them once a year up and down the state. Take, take that opportunity. They're wonderful experiences. Uh, the question about why I am running, which you heard earlier, um, think about it. Practice it, because you'll be asked over and over and over again, why are you running for office? And not only that, but then what would you do once you're in office? And I hear so many candidates talk about what their platform is, but not what they would do once they're in office. And that's really, really important. Um, join the League of Women Voters. Join the Women's Political Committee. There are other organizations in town. But get engaged with them, because they focus on not only how to run for office, but also on issues. Uh, this is the most important thing. If you're really thinking about running for office, create a path for it. And I don't know if we think about it. I think about Janet and having been on the uh, school board for 12 years before she ran for board of supervisors. There are different ways to do this, but 
think about what steps you might like to take. Uh, for example, get on a border commission. You may not want to run for office, but you might want to be engaged in the public sector. You may just be, that might be enough. But whether it is or not, it will give you lots of experience in the public sector. Um, I'd be glad to talk to anybody who's interested in running for office because I do that a lot and I encourage women, and we need more women, Gloria, we do. Um, once you are in office, and all of us have talked about it differently, here's what I, I encourage you to do. Use your power. It's all about being there, being, having a seat at the table, taking advantage of it, whether it's emergency facilities, whether it's preserving open space, whatever it is, but take, take advantage of that seat that you have at the table and use that power. And the last thing I want to say is when you are getting ready to leave, make sure your successor is a woman. Yeah. Yeah, that's so important. Yeah, so important. Thank you so much. Okay. We have, we have one, actually two more little treats. One is... Continuing the celebration of where we are now and where we are going. Can I have the lights? Do you want us out of? No, no, please. No? Okay. Should be fine. Voting as a right and a fight. At the Women's March of 2017, the day after the inauguration, millions of women and their allies across the country and around the world came together and renewed their commitment to community and democracy. At the 2018 midterm election, nearly 100 years after winning the right to vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment, record numbers of women ran and won public office. This is just the beginning. A feature-length documentary coming 2020. Okay, so that's my, that's my plug. We can have the lights back on. So if you want to learn more about my project, we have um, postcards in the back or in the front by the doors. We have our final treat, and I would like to invite Sandy Kiefman, who was a staff member on with, working with Joy Pikus, another woman with a lot of stories to tell. Oh, yes, I do, <laughs> but I'm not going to do it. Um, it took me a long time. I, I, I tried every way I could to think of how I was going to get Joy here to speak to the women in this community because she's so inspiring. And um, one of my fondest with, uh, memories is of Joy uh, invading the men's club in uh, Los Angeles. Was it the Los Angeles City Club? and demanding that they have women members. So she did it. She did it. They have women in there now. Um, I want to thank Joy for coming. Just a little token of little Santa Barbara treasures. And um, thank you all for coming to see her and for all of you who were so inspiring. Um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Please join us for a reception in the side room there. Let me, Thanks let me, again. Let me just say, let me just say thank you to Sandy. How, how uh, much I appreciate whatever's in there. I'll look at it in a couple of minutes. And I, I did almost forget that yes, I did introduce the legislation uh, to end discrimination in private clubs in Los Angeles. Inspired to do so by women who wanted to play golf at LA Country Club, etc. But in the course of, of doing that, and it was a sexy issue. The press loved it. My constituents constituents couldn't have cared, but the press loved it. I came across this wonder, and I came across, I invented this wonderful, wonderful play, phrase, princes of privilege in their palaces of power. <laughs> <laughs> Worked a half an hour on it, but got it. <laughs> Thank you, Joy. Thank you, everyone.